What is up, YouTube family? Welcome to an epic interview. I am joined by the other half of the Warwick duo. Um, this Alluvium game looks so, so sick. And we did an interview. I did an interview with Kieran a little while ago just about like kind of how Alluvium got started, uh, what the, the vision was kind of behind that. But Aaron is actually the brains behind the game itself, the the, the gameplay of the RPG and the and the turn based uh, game as well. So I'm really excited that you're joining me here today, Aaron, um, for for this interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for for having me. I'm I'm not so I'm not so sure I'm the the brains behind it, <laughs> but I I I did do a fair amount of the gameplay and the story of it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah but so definitely not brains. Can you? So I heard from Aaron's perspective, kind of how this all all got started. Maybe we could start uh, hearing from your perspective a little bit. How how did Alluvium launch? And and yeah, what's the background story behind this founding of this? I think one of the first, or it might be the first AAA blockchain game that's released. So I I would say that I'm just as mystified as anyone else as to how it actually began. The, the difference between myself and Kieran is he's quite bullish about everything that he does. And I would say that I'm definitely more on the conservative side of it, mm -hmm. but a long time, uh, a long time ago, I was, I was looking at doing something similar to this. And when Kieran came to me, I was actually in the process of starting to develop my own game it was actually a different game to to what alluvium is but because the ideas that he came to me with were so cool and and unique i i decided that i would sort of put aside that one we would we would park it for a little bit and we mm -hmm. would work together put you know two heads are better than one sort of a situation he's really good with marketing and promotion mm -hmm. and i i thought that i might be able to take his idea for a game and flesh it out into something a little bit more than, mm -hmm. than what it was. And so we decided that instead of us doing separate things, we would just combine our, our powers together. As far as it being as sort of big and successful as, as what it has been, the only thing that I can say to explain it is that at every step of the way, we've both gone all in, mm -hmm. in terms of our time, money, our thought process behind the whole thing mm -hmm. we you know we both had other businesses that we had come from and we both basically put them away within about a month of deciding to start and that was a big thing it was, it was something mm -hmm. that uh, I'd been doing for 10 years prior to that but it it had felt right for me to change what I was doing and for whatever reason this particular game has just it's just always felt right. And mm. I'm, I'm one of the least fatalistic people. I, don't, I, don't, I, I wouldn't think of the world as like there's some, some destiny or anything to it. Mm -hmm. But if anything was going to convince me that there was any type of destiny out there for, for anyone, then this game is it. Because every step of the way, there's been just a million coincidences which have allowed mm. us mm. to do exactly what we want. And at this stage... I've just decided that I'm going to be all in now, all in in the future, and I'll just keep on being all in mm -hmm. the whole time. So mm -hmm. that, that's effectively how it started. Okay, that's that's cool. Thanks for thanks for sharing that that perspective that you have there. So let's talk about how how did you go about creating? Like, how much of the concept did your brother bring to you? And then how did you go about <laughs> fleshing out? alluvium and and really getting into like how it would feel as a player to to walk through this world so the 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 lucky thing for me was that i'd been as part of one of my hobbies i, I like to just write books for myself and mm -hmm. i've been i've been plotting out a, a book that had had a very large backstory and when we decided to come up with this idea i i came back to kieran and said instead of it being this how about we make it this this other thing mm -hmm. and which was closer to what we're, we're at now and then once we nutted out the overall details mm -hmm. about what it would be we then he just let me sort of go and and do it and at that point i took 
a, a healthy chunk of the books that I had been writing and repurpose them for mm. the alluvial story. Yeah. And it, it adds a the, the, the tricky thing with a crypto game compared to just a, a standard single player game is mm-hmm. it's not even like you've got a massively multiplayer game where everybody's in there, but you also have this idea that people own their own assets. Mm-hmm. And as soon as that gets added to the mix, it actually becomes really complicated and restrictive to add a story to that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why you, you see with a whole bunch of the games that have come out or are coming out in the crypto space that they're very much around like a metaverse where Mm. people decide what happens rather than there being a really rich story and background Mm. to it because there's just all these little elements that that go into making these stories that if you don't have full control over it you just Mm. can't do Mm. and so we tried to come up with something that would allow us to have a story element Mm-hmm. as well as having it be a much more generic game that's closer to a massively multiplayer game. The the game that we have looked at as a, a good example of how you can do story is the game League of Legends, yeah. which is a game where all you do is go into a lobby and you just play matches yeah. in ranked, and that's literally all it is, right? Mm-hmm. But in the background, they just have these little tiny snippets of story that have changed over time, mm-hmm. and they're now, I guess, like 11 or 12 years down in the process, and they've, they're they coming out with an anime this year and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And, and I thought about it, and I thought, that's mm-hmm. a very cool way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it, yeah, it doesn't mean you have any sort of particular story for any individual person, mm-hmm. but there's mm-hmm. still an overall yeah universe that has a yeah yeah exactly exactly and it makes it makes playing the game more immersive and it makes picking a character more immersive and you feel like even though for like a specific game you don't really need to know anything about the story for people who are really into it it gives you just a a a world of more depth to kind of dive into for those who who are really in love with the gameplay itself Yeah. yeah okay that's cool so Talk about how you envision a new player coming into the world. Like, what is a new player going to experience from yeah. the very beginning? Because if if I'm uh, viewing this 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 world right, it's it's going to be kind of like a, a role playing game at, at its core, where you're mm-hmm. you're going out into the world trying to catch these alluvials, and then there's going to be a an auto an auto battle uh, yeah. aspect of it as well. So, yeah. The, the best way that I could describe it, I mean, it's actually a little bit different now because uh, you're actually the first person I've spoke to on a podcast since we had the approval for Alluvium Zero, uh-huh. which is a mini game which happens, at, it starts at like the same time as Alluvium. So now there's actually already a branching story. So a person coming into the world could play that game or they could play the the main Alluvium game, or they could play both. And that sort of changes the way Mm. that they experience it. But for a person that's going into the Alluvium world, the best way to describe it is that you play as a survivor on a ship that has crashed onto an alien planet. Mm. And there is a lot of uh, mystery around what the planet is, what its history is, and also why alluvials are there and why they're the way that they are right there's there's all of these mysteries Mm -hmm. and rather than giving the player like a single character that they go through like sort of like a lara croft or or someone like that we let you play as any one of the crash survivors right so you're your your own unique person but you do have access to the world in ways that are significant because we have this world that will need to be unlocked over time Mm. And there are certain gameplay elements that you do that will allow you to unlock the game. So, for example, we have eight regions Mm -hmm. in our game planned, but at launch there will only be uh, effectively only two of them unlocked, right? Which will mean that somehow someone is going to have to unlock the next region. Mm -hmm. Once it's unlocked, everyone gets access to it, Mm -hmm. but you will be known forever as the person who unlocked that region. Oh, wow, that's really cool. And there is, there's a lot of story elements around that unlocking. Unfortunately, I can't quite go into it. Once we get to our cinematic trailer, which will come out towards the end of the year, things will start to fall into place as to how that will happen. 
Mm-hmm. But the, the, the underlying feel for a player going into this world is it's good to unlock regions just purely because it opens up things for everyone else. Mm-hmm. There is a story element as to why you're supposed to be doing it. And in the background, there is effectively a, a bit of politics and a fight between what we'd call the main character who is seen in our gameplay trailer and in the little snippets that we've done. Mm-hmm. So her, her name is Arlen. So she she's actually the captain of this ship that has crashed. Mm. So at, at, at the same time that you get to experience what she's experienced, you get to see the, the background. So we'll, we'll have little cinematic pieces that will show her, what her journey is. Mm-hmm. And then you'll have your own journey, which is that you're trying to become a ranger who collects these creatures, who fights back, who takes the, the planet over, basically clears it out mm-hmm. and uses these creatures in in battle to fight against other people. So mm. from, from a gameplay perspective, your loop is actually very simple. It is you travel out into these regions. Mm. There's different ways you can travel, and depending on how you travel, you can either travel for free or you can pay. Mm. And if you travel for free, you only get access to the free stuff in the region, but it basically acts as a tutorial that allows you to mine various or in the ground that allow you to build equipment Mm -hmm. or tools. Mm -hmm. You also get to harvest plants, which have special bonuses in them that are also part of the the forging process. Mm -hmm. And you can have these encounters with alluvials. I can't go into exactly every detail of going into an alluvial, but we basically have, if, if you've ever played Pokemon and you're walking along in the the long grass, and then all of a yeah. sudden you get that, yeah. Yeah, 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 and now yeah. you're in a battle. Mm-hmm. You'll have slightly more control than that, okay. but it'll it'll be a there'll be there'll be that, but it won't just be nonsense. It'll actually make sense as to what's happening. Mm-hmm. Probably the first few times, or maybe even for the first few months, people won't quite understand exactly what is happening, but that yeah. will build into the story elements of mm-hmm. it. And when you capture these creatures instead of like a standard JRPG where it's turn-based one-on-one or turn-based, say, five-on-five or whatever it is, we use an auto battler. So in the auto battler, you'll come into an encounter. It'll have a number of alluvials that you'll be fighting up against. Mm -hmm. You'll have to very quickly scan what types are they, as in what are their affinities, what are their classes, which are the strong ones, Mm -hmm. how are they positioned, and then you'll need to position your own characters and pick ones that combat that and then fight them. If you bite off more than you can chew, you might come up, come up against say five creatures mm-hmm. and you've only got three. Mm-hmm. Maybe the things you come up against are really strong. Yeah. You're probably not going to win that battle, but if you think creatively, you might find ways to win that battle. Mm-hmm. But effectively, once you press the play button, it'll be an auto battle. You don't have any control mm-hmm. over it. In fact, according to our combat engine, the the ranger character is effectively like an alluvial for the purposes of that action, okay, right? Okay. They, they have slightly different yeah. abilities. Their abilities are based on things like their their sword will determine, or the, not their sword, but their, their weapon determines their class. The weapon can be upgraded to give the ranger an affinity as mm-hmm. well, mm-hmm. which, are, and, and again, the affinities and the classes in our game combined to do what we call a a synergy bonus. So if you play a lot of water characters in your battle, they will get a bonus. Mm -hmm. If you play a lot of fires, they'll get a different bonus. Okay, kind of like teamfight tactics. Exactly like teamfight tactics, except it's a one-on-one battle. Mm -hmm. And when you play our ranked, it's also one-on-one. And so it's similar to other auto battlers in the sense that you're trying to build a good team, Mm -hmm. but that's not the whole purpose of it. Your actual purpose is to build a good team that counters the other team. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in a lot of the ones that that exist so far, those auto battlers like uh, Dota, Underlords, Teamfight Tactics, because the matches go for a very long time and you Mm -hmm. have a lot of rounds, Mm -hmm. by the time you get to the very end, it, it is quite difficult to combat your opponent whereas in this we're looking at it more like either hearthstone or chess 
where you're literally everything that you do is trying to combat what your opponent yeah. has just done. And because it's one on one, you you get to focus entirely on combating the the single yes. team that you're against. Yeah. Yeah, which okay. which we're hoping gives a little bit more strategic mm-hmm. depth to mm-hmm. the to yeah. the countering aspect of I, the game. Yeah, definitely. Rather will. than just trying to make a big like that in a lot of the games out there, there's like a, a bunch of meta teams that are just, they just happen to be generally strong, mm-hmm. but there's not really a lot of, well, this beats this and this beats this. It's just sort of, you can almost call them having a power level. Mm-hmm. And if you get a team with a high power level, that's kind of it. Yeah. Whereas with ours, one team might have a power level, let's say 10 out of 10 when it's up against this team. But if you put it up against another team, it's yeah. way, way down yeah, yeah, on the yeah, power. Yeah. You know? yeah. Okay, so can you talk a little bit about like the alluvial progression? So after you have an alluvial, that's not the end, right? And you're going to want to battle it just like a Pokemon to continue leveling it up. Yeah, so so there's there's levels for each character. So when you capture it, it'll have a random level. Mm -hmm. And that random level, well, technically it'll have a random amount of experience. Mm -hmm. And its experience determines what its level is. And that'll be tied to the NFT or... Or how, yeah, how will that work? So the the experience will be coded onto our back end because mm-hmm. NFTs, because they're immutable, they're, they're hard to yeah. change mm-hmm. the data. Mm-hmm. And because this is a, a changeable piece of data, we actually looked at a lot of ways of, of doing it. Like, for example, having each character have a an ERC-20 token, which has a certain amount of things with it. But it became incredibly complicated to do yeah. it that way. So that at this sense. stage... We're looking at doing it through our backend server, which is incredibly robust. So mm-hmm. effectively, that NFT will point to a position on our server, which will say that's what its experience is. As the battles go on, it'll go up. It also gives us a few extra uh, ways to punish people who are cheating through bots and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Because if everything is NFT based and then we ban an account, all they have to do is just transfer the NFTs to yep. another one mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. we're very hesitant to ban those particular nfts because maybe they get sold to someone who doesn't know that it's from a banned account it's yeah. really tough to see those sort of things mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. at this stage the plan is if we if someone does something bad and they want to transfer it at the very least we're punishing them from the perspective of the experience of their ranger mm-hmm. and the experience of their characters okay but, so so normally then way. when you sell one of your alluvials will it keep its experience so like will you be selling oh, yeah, yeah. okay okay 100 percent. yeah so it, that that'll just be a particular address has that one and when it is sold we just mm-hmm. point our server to the new one where it, where it's uh, where it's accessed mm-hmm. the only reason why we we have the ability to wipe it is just purely if someone is confirmed to be cheating yeah and that way because we we want the game to be fair yeah for, of course for and and honestly cheaters is, are one of my biggest fears when it comes to blockchain gaming because when yeah. you start to include real value the ability to make actual mm-hmm. money in a game it really incentivizes people to to try and figure yeah. out a way to abuse it yeah, when, when you're talking about a normal game that's not on the blockchain, the major currency is always time. Mm-hmm. Now, that time you can convert it into skill by getting better at the game. Yeah. You can convert it into levels, items, all that sort of stuff. But when you're talking about a game that has real money behind it, mm-hmm. the major currency becomes money. Yeah. And time just becomes something that people use to convert to money. And if there's enough money in the system, People will find ways of cheating, make 50,000 bots. Yeah. And then those bots will do the time element. Mm -hmm. And so we have built the game with the expectation that if there's a way for someone to convert time into money, they will do it perfectly and instantly. Mm -hmm. And so that means that when we were designing the game, we didn't want there to be any way to convert your time Mm -hmm. into money that that is in, in any meaningful way. So, for example, when you level up your alluvials, that does take you time, but it still requires you to capture it, which requires you to have a shard, which there is a cost to buy. You have to go out to a region to mm-hmm. get it, mm-hmm. which costs you to travel. And then if you want to fuse it into the next level, so we, we call them stages. Mm-hmm. So if you get three of stage one, you fuse them together into a, a single one of stage two, okay. there is a cost associated with that as well. So basically, one way that bots could do stuff is if they were able to play a lot 
better than you, mm -hmm. but they still have to put money back into the system. Mm -hmm. They still have to play in all of the standard ways. So even though there is potential for someone to bot, it's mm -hmm. no more than someone like farming it out to, to someone to, to play it 24 hours a day mm -hmm. and just pay someone to, to do your work for you. So it, it effectively means that the game is fairly safe from things like inflation killing it or mm -hmm. th there's no yeah. chance of things like going to zero value and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Okay. So I want to go back to, to something that you said near the beginning and you just mentioned it again, talking about the fees to travel. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I'm actually just listening to, to Ready Player One for the fourth time uh, right now. Yep. And in Ready Player One, one of the, the biggest barriers for Parzival was the fact that he was just so poor, he couldn't, he couldn't leave his, his school planet that he was kind of uh, stuck yep. on. Um, so are, did you kind of like pull from that Ready Player One uh, idea to, to come up with this idea of, of like travel costs and then go a little bit more in detail on how like paying to travel to a different region might unlock like more value that you're able to, to gather for yourself. Okay. So uh, it, it might seem a little bit strange, but I've never played a Pokemon game in okay. my life. Uh -huh. Okay. I, I know a lot about Pokemon just, I guess, through osmosis or, or whatever, you know, just by by being someone it's who's permeated in culture in a way yeah, yeah yeah i i have also not seen ready player one but i understand the concepts behind it mm -hmm. i i can i can safely say that most of the ideas that have come from this game they, they may have come from other people who have seen these things but when it comes to me i have a very um much more regimented look at how, how to design games it's much more from the how to design good games approach as far as mechanics go rather mm. than copying games that exist yeah in fact one of the one of the biggest issues with the dota underlords and team fight tactics for me was that i didn't like a lot of the things about it so i tried to pull them apart and figure yeah. out what needed to be done differently. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's a lot of inspiration from this game. It's it's fairly weird, right? And it could be that some people look at it and they say, nope, I don't like the sound yeah. of going into a region and doing these things. I mean, I, I would say that the experience of going into a region is, is actually closer to buying a packet of cards, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I would say if you really wanted to break it down, reduce it to the most absurd notion, our yeah. entire RPG is literally just you're buying a packet of cards, but instead of it being cards that you just get and they're yours and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. You go into a region that instead of having 10 cards has a hundred cards mm -hmm. and oh, by the way, you're only able to take 10 or 15 of them out mm -hmm. and you have to choose which ones mm -hmm. and you can look through them all. But if you look through them all, now you can only take three or four. Mm. If you don't look through them all, you might be able to take 10 or 15. Uh -huh. And so there's a bunch of different player uh, choices that they can make. I, I, I put them into the, the Kieran boat and then the Aaron boat. The, the Kieran player is going to go in there. They're not going to look at each of the cards. Mm. We, we call it scanning. So again, there's there's plants to harvest. There's ores to mine out of deposits and then there's encounters to do mm -hmm. out of all of them before you go into it or before you collect it you can scan them mm -hmm. and that lets you know how rare is the stuff that's inside it but that does cost you a little bit of energy and every time you travel you've only got a finite amount of energy so you've got okay. to make those tough mm -hmm. decisions so that the kieran way is get as many things as possible Mm -hmm. And it'll be a little bit random as to what you get. But yeah. then when you come out of it, you'll be like, I got 20 things. Mm -hmm. The Aaron mm -hmm. way of playing will be more scan a lot more of the stuff. You don't get as much, but you'll be able to pick and choose the ones you think are a little bit more uh, sort of valuable. And with, our, with the help of our data analyst, Perry, we've worked out a system that sort of mathematically means that neither of them is the best strategy. Mm. And in fact, any strategy in between is roughly as good. Huh. So if you want to scan a little bit, if you want to scan a lot, none at all, all of it, it should give you a similar expected value of 
like I guess dollars that, that mm. you could get out of that yeah. uh, that travel. As far as what travel actually looks like, the the best way that I can describe it is that there is four ways. No one knows this, and I won't tell all of it, but there's there's four ways to travel into any of the regions. Okay? okay, and maybe by saying that number, that'll trigger some people that are really, really deep into the, the mm -hmm. weeds of our game. Mm -hmm. They might be able to understand what that means. But we have eight regions, seven of them uh, travelable, and one of them is your home base. We call it Sanctum Mesa. Mm -hmm. So of those seven regions, the only difference between them is not like how difficult a region is or anything like that. It's what you'll find there that is the main mm -hmm. difference. So, for example, we have a region called Halcyon Sea, which is effectively a giant inland sea that has been caused by, uh, <laughs> I can't say that, but uh, <laughs> let's, just, let's just say that there's a waterfall that has caused uh, an area that's not normally a sea to now be flooded for a very long time, right? Okay. And so when you run around in this region, you're sort of like splashing all the time. You're in just a tiny little bit of water. Mm -hmm. And that region will be filled with a lot of what we would call water affinity alluvials. Okay. There is yeah. another region which is called the Crimson Waste, which is a very harsh, hot, uh, red and black desert. And when you go into that region, you're more likely to find fire creatures. Mm -hmm. There's seven mm -hmm. regions. I think they've all been uh, mentioned, but mm -hmm. if if they if they haven't, then th there's like, for example, there's one that is called Shard Bluff Labyrinth, and it's sort of like a a rocky, airy region. Mm -hmm. And so, like when you go there, you'll find the creatures that are more in our earth affinity or air affinity. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's it's not exact, but every region sort of has like a major thing that you'll find in it mm -hmm. and then a minor thing and then everything else will be considered to be very rare. Mm -hmm. So we have an ice region. You could find ramfire there. Now, I don't think that that is something that you're likely to do yeah, because yeah. ramfire is is an inferno character yeah, yeah. but but it's possible that you could find one there mm -hmm. and just be incredibly rare mm -hmm. and so when you go into these regions it's more about you targeting the type of characters that you want and if you want to go play ranked you're going to need to have a deck that is fairly balanced mm -hmm. right so i mean i guess you could just go like you just all in on fire creatures yeah. okay. and that would be fine, but it's probably not going to be the best against everyone. Mm -hmm. So in, in a ranked match where you're, where you're one-on-one -on -one against another mm -hmm. human player that has their alluvials, how is the mm -hmm. setup process going to work so that each player is able to count, try to counter the other player? Like, will you kind of know who the other player's alluvials are uh, before yes. the match starts and then they'll know yeah. who, who your alluvials are and like, mm -hmm. how, how will that work? So you, you can think of it like uh, a roster phase or a, or a draw phase where you go back and forth mm -hmm. placing characters down. Okay. And you, you have, there's a game that I think everyone who wants to be good at our game should play. It's, it's, it's called Chess Automate. Chess Automate, it's, okay. It's I not an auto battler. It's mm -hmm. literally a game of chess where instead of playing chess where you just play the pieces and go back and forth mm -hmm. you play a setup of pieces mm -hmm. and each piece costs you an amount of they just call it points right so if you have a look at some of our user interface stuff you'll see the points cost of some of the cards mm -hmm. the higher the stage and the higher the tier the higher the points cost and so when you play your characters you only get a certain amount of points to play so you can you can go all in and, and have like maybe seven weaker characters and have like a big team that's got lots of things going on. Mm -hmm. Or you can go for a team of maybe even only three that is very small, but they're all incredibly powerful characters. Yeah, yeah. And it could be that that 
is a better way of mm. playing the game. And so there'll be people that have different strategies and you'll just have to work out mm. what's going to work against my opponent. One of my favorite things that I'm hearing from all of this is that you got you want the players to be able to decide how they want to play the game. And like you're you're mm. not saying like there's a right and a wrong way to do these things. It's like the player gets to explore and figure out the gameplay style that they like the best. And that sort of freedom, I think, is really yeah. cool. And a lot of a lot of yeah. games kind of miss that, that side of it, that the player wants to be in control of their own destiny and play the game yeah. how they want to play it and not be penalized because it's not the way the designer was was picturing it. Yeah, we, we, we've made some very clear choices early on because we have sort of a, a long-term goal of this game growing, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're not even launching uh, as a... Uh, a finished product we're launching is what we call an open beta so we want to launch with the core features mm -hmm. that allow people to play ranked and to go out into the world mm -hmm. but there's a lot of tweaks that people will see i mean we're we have an art artist team that is like incredibly thorough with getting everything to look really right yeah but even they have like a million things that they're like this looks like crap this looks like <laughs> yeah, crap. yeah we sure. gotta change this mm -hmm. and and so there's a lot of features that we want to add over the course of the next five years, not just to this game, but other games that go into it. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we know that as far as the actual core mechanics, they're very tight. They mm -hmm. aren't, this, this definitely is not a game where you can go out into the world and you can, like chop a tree down and then you can cut it into firewood, then you can set that on fire and then you can get a parachute out and float off into the distance and yeah, yeah, yeah. drop bombs on things. <laughs> there, there are games out there that have like much more uh, rich mechanics in some ways, mm -hmm. whereas ours is, like I said, it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite tight mm -hmm. because we want to get those things right from a yeah. perspective of mm -hmm. it being a blockchain game. Mm -hmm. So things like how you do encounters, how you mine in the world, they're, they're, they're limited, but I would say they're complete and, and fairly decent. Hopefully mm -hmm. people think they are, but what, what we're, the purpose of all of that is that this can explode over time and mm -hmm. it can become very rich. We want to add other games. We've had people say that they would really love to have like an MMO, uh, cooperative modes and all mm -hmm. sorts of things. Mm -hmm. We want all of those things too. Yeah. But the first step, is we have to get assets into people's hands mm -hmm. and we have to get them into a particular thing that can be addictive for them. So whether that's the collecting loop mm -hmm. or whether that is the ranked loop mm -hmm. or whether now with Alluvium Zero, the manufacturing loop, we're trying to make mm -hmm. all of those things addictive, have a lot of choices to them, can but you, they're just what they are. Can you go into the manufacturing loop at all? Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we did. Are you out... okay if we go a little longer here? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm really enjoying this conversation. So yeah, this, the, is, this is great. The Alluvium Zero game design document, the, the very initial parts of it we put out, it was only something like 30 pages or something. So it was quite cut down, mm -hmm. but that game will get, again, same thing. It'll, it'll expand over time. So the yeah. idea is we always want there to be choices to make. So in Alluvium Zero, you play as a reconnaissance drone. Mm. So from a story element, when this ship crashes, the people in Alluvium are the people on that ship. Yeah, yeah. The people in Alluvium Zero are the drones that get jettisoned off to undertake research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they actually, uh, th th there's, there's an element of them being separated, right? They can't interact with the people in the main game mm -hmm. except through a type of teleportation, right? Which only allows certain types of matter to come back and forth, which we're calling fuel. But effectively in Alluvium Zero, you'll, you'll land on a parcel of land, which you'll choose by purchasing it through our land sale. Okay. You'll know everything about the land and we'll give more details about what does it look to have a good piece of land? Mm -hmm. Is it good to have your resource sites close together? Is it good to have them far apart? Is it good to maybe, maybe Crimson Waste is the best place to get land. Maybe that's like way better. Or maybe, maybe Tiger Boreal is the best place. Like we've mm -hmm. got, you can get land on all the different regions. 
Maybe it's good to get two pieces of land next to each other. But all mm -hmm. of these things will come up over time. But effectively, if you've ever played any of those basic city builder type games, mm -hmm. something like Simpsons Tapped Out mm -hmm. or like maybe a really cut down version of Clash of Clans, because again, this is a mini game, mm -hmm. you will place your original uh, building down, which we're calling a nexus. That sort of determines what you do from there. So you place it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then you'll place down things like resource extractors, resource converters, fuel extractors, converters, uh, research facilities. There's a materials lab. There's a what we're calling a singularity scanner, which is where you scan the alluvials. Mm -hmm. And where you place things on the map will have a significant impact to how efficient they are, what buildings they're next to, this sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. there, again, there'll always be choices to make. You could be the sort of person who wants to go heavily towards manufacturing resources, mm -hmm. which are the, the underlying materials in the game. And then we actually you're going to be able to sell these that. to the players? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so the what we call elements, there's hydrogen, there's uh, carbon, and there's silicon. They're what we're calling like the three building blocks of every building. Mm -hmm. And you might be the sort of person who wants to invest heavy into energy production. So you would do hydrogen type mm -hmm. buildings that mm -hmm. require lots of hydrogen. You might want to go into the industrial side and the extracting, in which case you would uh, get the carbon type buildings, or you might want to go heavily into research. So you would try to get a lot of silicon and build those type of buildings, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at purchasing a piece of land, you'll see which sites exist on the land and you might say i want that one because it's got three silicon sites mm -hmm. and that might be like what you're into you know mm -hmm. you can trade them on the marketplace with other players so if you're really deficient in hydrogen you can purchase it off other players mm -hmm. and that way you can like share and, and come up together mm -hmm. but the, the the three main goals of the game would be number one generate fuel mm -hmm. Now, fuel it comes in three types, and effectively, you'll sell that onto a, uh, a shared pool. So just like you can have ILV and ETH in a, mm -hmm. in a balance of pool, you can, you can have more than one item in the pool. And effectively, we'll just see that at the start. And players, when they get their fuel, they'll just sell fuel into the pool and just extract ETH straight away. Okay, okay. Right? So it's a... It's a simple, you don't need to put it up on a marketplace or anything. It's just a one-to-one a -one interaction that will happen instantly. And away you go. Now you've got your ETH or you can put ETH in and extract fuel. Mm -hmm. And you would do that if mm -hmm. you're on the other side, if you're in yeah. the alluvium side, mm -hmm. because if you want to fuse those characters together, yeah. if you want to travel, if you want to do all of these things, you'll need a type of fuel. Mm -hmm. That effectively is what powers all the things in the game. Hmm. So, so... You're not just like buying fuel from from the alluvium team when you're when you're playing alluvium. You're literally buying it from other players that have been mining yeah. it in alluvium yep. zero. That we, that's we have yeah. That's we, so we cool. We have a few little safeguards. So for example, the the current system which was approved by the council was that there would be a tap coming directly from the DAO. So so the DAO itself will be supplying some amount of fuel, mm -hmm. roughly half, mm -hmm. and players will be supplying the other half. Okay. And we do that because it just gives us a few more levers. We can withhold a bit of fuel, mm. which can make the cost of fuel go up. Yeah, yeah. We can put more in, mm -hmm. which will bring it down. And so that it gives us a few levers to keep things relatively balanced. But mm. the reason why I like it is because when a player decides to sell a massive bunch of fuel, yeah. they don't have to sell it straight away. Mm -hmm. They can withhold it. And it could be that maybe 80% of all of the fuel resources get withheld for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And people in the game are buying fuel. So now there's less fuel in the pool, mm -hmm. which means that the cost of fuel is going up. Mm -hmm. And at some point, the cost of fuel will be very high, which will mean that the people in the game will be like, oh, I want to wait a little bit before mm -hmm. I buy it. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to find the right time to strike <laughs> and sell your yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, fuel in, right? So so it allows a little bit of a game. of Effectively, what we've done is we've found a way to gamify staking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So That's really cool, yeah. 
Normal yeah. staking is like you'll you'll put something into a particular pool, and depending on which pool you stake in, it'll maybe make the the emissions of that pool go down a bit. You got to choose mm -hmm. which one to be in. Mm -hmm. With us, you're literally staking into the the virtual ground, pulling stuff out, and then just choosing how you want to deal with it. Yeah. And fuel is also used as a requirement inside of Alluvium Zero as well. Mm. So sometimes you might not want to sell it. You might want to reinvest it into mm -hmm. your own mm -hmm. buildings mm -hmm. to get them bigger so that then you can yeah. pull more out later yeah. on. Yeah. So it's there's a lot of different strategies that players can do. And this is this is where we, we like the idea of things being simple and tight, understandable, mm -hmm. but with real mm -hmm. consequences. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This is going to be so cool. I cannot wait to jump into this, into this world. So, but before we end, I want to talk about alluvials just a tiny bit more. Um, because sure. like, so some of these, some of these alluvials that you're going to be cap capturing in the open beta, um, like there's a limited supply of them, right? And after they're mm -hmm. gone, you're not gonna be able to capture any more of them again. Mm -hmm. So for players that are in at the very beginning that are capturing some of these, uh, this first set of alluvials, yep. like, Five years from now, they might be there. Might be some very valuable characters uh, that other people really mm -hmm. want. They they can no longer find in the world, and they need to buy it from players that were at the very beginning. Yeah, there, there is. So there, there's definitely an advantage for being in in the start. We we very specifically early on said we don't want to give people the ability to like pay a bunch of money now mm -hmm. to get stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing usable in the game that isn't cosmetic. And there won't ever be before we launch, which means that on day one, you can choose to go into Alluvium Zero, you can choose to go into Alluvium, but you can't choose both. You've got to try and work out what is your place in this world. Yeah. And if you go down the path of being like a collector of alluvials mm -hmm. and someone else goes down the path of being someone who collects the ore and, and makes weapons and armor and things like that, that will give you an advantage for later on. The, the more alluvials you have, the better your team will be, the more other alluvials you'll be able to catch. But if you start manufacturing things, then you'll be able to get a bit of a, a benefit there. So everyone has to choose what they want to do. But as far as the alluvials go, once you go into the world, there, there's effectively an infinite supply, mm -hmm. but it's a time-gated infinite supply. Okay. And okay. it's also a bonding curve gated supply so mm -hmm. where, if you're the first person to come against a particular character mm -hmm. it will be the easiest to capture that it will ever be okay so okay that makes you will have to get a, a shard of we have shards that come in a bunch of different tiers mm -hmm. effectively tier just just means like how good is it mm -hmm. and stage means how uh progressed is it right mm -hmm. so with with the shards it might be that you only need a tier one shard to capture this thing say 80 percent of the time mm -hmm. but once there's been ten thousand of them captured mm -hmm. the power of the alluvial is going up all of the time which means that when you try to capture it with a tier one shard maybe it used to be 80 percent, maybe now it's 20 percent. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that would mean if you really want that thing don't use that shard because you'll yeah. try, you'll probably fail mm -hmm. and then it'll escape mm -hmm. and then it's gone. Once it's gone, it's gone forever and you'd have to travel in and, and get it. You won't break your own shards, but you will let things go, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe over time you want to start using, say, a tier two shard or a tier three. And if you want to get a tier three shard, remember someone has to effectively mine that out of the ground. Mm -hmm. So you can't buy it from us. You can't go to our website and like alluvialshards.com and yeah, yeah, just yeah. buy a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. You can only buy it from another player who's already yeah. gone. Mm -hmm. So it makes the whole thing organic. Yeah. At the start of the game, no one's going to have tier five shards unless they're mm -hmm. incredibly lucky. But someone might get a tier one. They might use it to capture something, which then lets them go a bit further. And, mm -hmm. and then we just want everyone to have this nice progression towards mm -hmm. getting the, the team that they want. But I would imagine that it'll be probably very expensive to capture everything, mm -hmm. right? Like to get all 150, to get them all up to the highest level. Mm -hmm. Maybe some people want to get all 150 in all of the different the materials like there's hollow and shiny so to get all these different ones would be 
like just ridiculously hard. So what, what we want is for people to be able to get like a, a subset of them mm-hmm. that allow that allows them to go and make a deck or two or three different decks so that when they go into ranked, they have a good experience playing yeah. where they've got most of them, right? Yeah. Without needing every single character. Yeah. The other advantage that we do in ranked is if you own the stage one version of a character, you can, for the purposes of that deck, play it as if it's a stage two or three. Hmm. Or if you've got the stage three, you could play it as a stage one. Hmm. You do that in the deck building phase. So if you don't own Ram Fire, but you do own Ram Fee, when you mm-hmm. go play mm-hmm. ranked, you could go and, and do it. But if you're in the RPG world and you're encountering things, mm-hmm. that ramp is rampy. Okay. That's all it is, right? Yeah. So it kind of it evens out the strength in ranked. So this really, really skill based. Yeah. But on the RPG side, the pro- the progression is very important yeah, in yeah. order it's to continue grinding. building yeah. your. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes and, sense. And uh, th- so I would say, like, I, I wasn't ever able to find a way to make the ranked mode be not at all pay to play Mm -hmm. without making it feel not special. It would have been very easy to just say, we'll make a type of ranked mode that's very similar to the other games out there and just say for ranked play, you can have everything. Mm -hmm. But especially at the start of the game, we felt it wouldn't make everything feel as special if you're building this team over here but when you go play ranked, you can, everything is accessible, right? Mm -hmm. It just, Mm -hmm. it wouldn't feel right. Whereas in, in our game, if you go out into the world and you look into your alluviary, Ilu- which is effectively the, the, the equivalent of a Pokedex, mm-hmm. it's all going to be blank yeah. until someone captures it. Yeah. Right. And when mm-hmm. someone captures that thing, then it'll pop up and it'll say their name, that they're the one who captured that thing. So you, you won't know what there is. I mean, unfortunately our art director and, uh, my other co-founder, Kieran, are very, very good at leaking a whole bunch <laughs> yeah. of stuff. Mm-hmm. So there is a lot of things. I think the people who are following the game closely now, they'll know a lot about it. I, I, mm-hmm. I estimated the other day that something like 80 alluvials have been leaked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In fact, the... But there's not a place where you can go and find them all, at least not easily. Um, so it's so have to be very no. dedicated in order to yeah, actually. Yeah, which is which is why I'm, yeah. I'm 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 not like shooting daggers at them to, to, <laughs> yeah. to stop it. But I but I have said you know like that that we should try to to keep it down just so that there's some mystery. Mm-hmm. So like mm-hmm. for example, um, the character that I've wanted in the game since the beginning, we just had it ideated last week, mm-hmm. and I don't want them to leak that for example <laughs> yeah, yeah. because to yeah. me it's a very special character and. And I want there to be things where people go into the game, they're like, what the hell is that? Yeah. You know? Okay. In All fact, right. I believe that you guys have uh, you, you guys have a character that is part of a leak, if I'm Yeah, not yeah. Well, let's let's talk about my character a little bit and then and so explain a little bit, explain how like the on-chain gaming skin, how how that works. And then after I'll explain how people can actually win uh mm-hmm. the super cool rare on-chain gaming alluvial. <laughs> so the the one that that you guys have partnered with us to do is is called a flesh mm-hmm. it is a tier 0 which does mean that it's not quite as powerful as the other ones but mm-hmm. i i do i do want to say that the tier zeros are slightly different to the tiers 1 through 5 in a couple of law based ways okay so they are very they're, they're unique in some ways and, mm-hmm. and and not in others so this particular one is the scion tier zero Mm -hmm. we have we have a a a tier zero for every one of our five base classes Mm -hmm. and this one is scion which is effectively our equivalent of say like a mage so it's like a wizard type of a character Mm -hmm. and the one that you guys have i believe is the earth affinity version Mm -hmm. so anything that's sort of purple in our game is considered like earth as in like uh ground-based character you know Mm -hmm. because in the in in our in this world of alluvium the ground is it's got like these purple crystals in it so so that's where it comes from so this is a range-based character it effectively has what we call a lollipop for a tail (laughs) and it uses it as a as a beam and so this particular one is a special limited edition version Mm -hmm. and like all of the ones in our game like i said there's nothing that you can get that you go be able to 
play in the game because we don't want people to get an advantage mm -hmm. on day one. Mm -hmm. But this will be incredibly limited edition. Mm -hmm. Remember, there'll be possibly a million flishes out there eventually, especially mm -hmm. being tier zero. It's actually one of the free characters. Mm -hmm. But this particular one is very rare. Yeah. So only a few people are going yeah, to be I think there's only going to be a hundred total. So yeah. yeah, if you have if you have one of the on chain gaming ones, uh, almost no one else will have it. So exactly, yeah. yeah. So so the 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 idea behind that is that uh, even though it's what's considered a promotional NFT, it will be considered uh, collectible. I, I can't say what what they're going to be valued at, yeah. but mm -hmm. if you go and look at promo Pokemon cards and things like that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people out there that have the standard stuff because you can buy it. They, they manufacture it in, you know, by mm -hmm. the millions. But when it comes to the promo stuff, there'll be a hundred and that's it ever. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. If, if people get it, then they can think themselves very lucky. I do remember someone telling me that they had got a promotional NFT. I can't remember which one it was, but it was for, for a different company that had a different alluvial mm -hmm. and the guy was offered something like thirty-five thousand dollars for it, or wow. something, and he ended yeah. up he ended up turning it down because he was <laughs> like, "No, I think it might be worth more later on." Mm -hmm. And so I don't I don't know where, where they're eventually going to go, but we we've pulled out all of the stops on the artwork for these. Oh, it's beautiful! Yeah, yeah. I feel like the the tier zeros are some of the uh, best work that we've done, mm -hmm. and from our concept art team when we originally envisaged or when I envisaged what these things were mm -hmm. from a story element, I will say these are by far the hardest for our concept art team to come up with mm -hmm. just purely because they, they're slightly different from a law perspective. Mm -hmm. And once people understand the law, they'll, they'll say, Oh yeah, now, now I can see that that would have been incredibly hard to do, but I feel like we've, we, we have pulled it off for all of the tier tier zeros mm -hmm. and yeah they're, they're just an interesting cool thing some people have yeah. them as their absolute favorite characters i mm -hmm. i love them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's really cool so uh for those of you guys who who are curious the way that you can enter to win the on-chain gaming alluvial is there will be a link in the description to join the alluvium discord and i'll probably also have it as a pinned comment and the winners of these alluvials i believe we're going to be giving 80 of the alluvials away through the link. So literally just you guys that are watching who are joining the alluvium discord uh, through the link in the description, 80 will be given away. I think so far there's been uh, like three or four, maybe 5,000 people that have joined through this. So your odds are not actually that bad if you think about it. Mm. Um, you, you have a pretty good chance. And a lot of people were actually asking um, in the Kieran interview and then also in the solo video that I did about alluvium, uh, if you were already a part of the Alluvium Discord, like, can you can you still enter? Um, and I think what you would need to do, like, tell your friend to join, or like, get your mom to join yeah. the Alluvium Discord. Get your tell your brother about it. Tell like tell yeah. your tell your friends about it, and that I think will be the best way to give yourself a chance uh, to win. If you're already in, like, just tell somebody else to join uh, that might be willing to to share with you uh, if if they do if they do win the Alluvial. Um, all right. Did you have any closing thoughts, Aaron, that you wanted to, to give about this? Such a this is such a cool concept. I cannot wait for it to to like actually be in in my hands so I can play it. I I would say that if the the thing that a lot of people are sleeping on with the game is that we do have ten percent of all of the tokens to be given away as in game yield, mm -hmm. and if you see the the value of the coin at the moment, I, I can't know what the value is going to be at launch or, or any time after that, but it's a significant amount of money, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we're planning, um, we, we haven't given any exact details to the prize pool, but some amount of months after we launch the ranked mode, when people have gotten good, we want to have an international tournament mm -hmm. and the prize pool for that will be a significant amount of ILV. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you, if you're good at, at gaming, if you want to get in there in that open beta and play, I, 
I read through, I, I can't say I read through every comment, but I read through a lot of the stuff that comes in our Discord. In fact, there's been plenty of good ideas that we've implemented into the game. I've tried to contact a bunch of extremely high level pro players from other games that are similar to mm -hmm. our water battler mm -hmm. to get their opinions on how we should do it. What are the things that are lacking in these other games? Mm -hmm. So if, if you've got any inkling to play a game at a high level, there's, there's a good chance that there'll be some decent prize pools mm -hmm. on the line and, and why not? I mean, yeah. if, if that's what you're good at, then you might as well give it a shot. We want to have the biggest tournament that has ever existed. Mm -hmm. All right. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron, for joining me for this interview. No I, I've, my, yeah. my understanding of the game has definitely expanded through this. And I think even people that have been closely following Alluvium uh, from the beginning will definitely be able to pick out some tidbits from this that uh, sure. they found. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be, there's going to be lots of things that people pick up over time. I, I've tried to make sure that we keep some things under wraps mm -hmm. just purely so that it's a bit of fun for yeah. people. Yeah. So you have something to explore end, when people, you're playing. Yeah. I, I've always loved being able to like get into things over time and learn mm. the little details about it. So mm. it feels weird to be on the other side of it <laughs> yeah. and trying to trying to to keep things under wraps. But we've we've we're trying to live as much as we possibly can by the idea that we are a, a decentralized organization. Mm. We I, I debate with people all the time. I'll debate really hard in chat so mm. I, I don't mean anything personally by it but if i think someone's wrong about something i'll say you're wrong <laughs> and we try to get a good understanding of what the community wants so that we can build it better mm. I, I will say that it, it has added an extra layer of complexity because instead of just siloing ourselves off and just saying we're going to build whatever the hell we want and mm. you guys don't get a say in it because we do want people to have a say in everything we've had to think about all of these different pieces how can we fit it in it, it, it is making it to be an incredibly challenging prospect, mm -hmm. but I, I think in the end we'll be up to the challenge and I hope that people enjoy the game when they get their hands on it. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks so much for joining us for this interview. If you enjoyed it, remember to leave a big thumbs up as the YouTube algorithm will spread this interview to way more people if they if they know the people who are watching it enjoyed it. And then make sure you guys are joining uh, the Alluvium Discord to stay up to date with all things Alluvium. They uh, show all their announcements there. And if you want to stay up to date, that's the best place to follow what's going on with Alluvium. And then if you want to keep following this channel, On Chain Gaming, because you're excited about this new world of play to earn crypto gaming, of collect NFT gaming, which is going to provide value to you and just what the block chain is doing to player ownership and stuff, then make sure uh, that you're subscribing to this channel as well. Oops. And yeah. And until next time, everyone have fun roaming the metaverse.